Russia's S-400 Triumph is widely touted as one of, if not the most capable air defense system in the world. With the ability to leverage a variety of missiles to engage different air threats at ranges up to 250 miles, the S-400 has widely touted counter-stealth capabilities, and it's gained a reputation as one of the few systems capable of countering America's air dominance approach to warfare. But is that true? Let's dive into the S-400 and what it's really capable of. I'm Alex Hollings, and this is Air Power. Among the heated debates that you can find on social media and in forums about aviation, the question of how well the S-400 can defend against America's stealth fighters comes up pretty often. Depending on which side of the Iron Curtain your loyalties lie, you may either see the S-400 as the kryptonite to America's stealth-focused air dominance approach to warfare, or just another overhyped piece of Russian equipment benefiting from a great deal of media manipulation. And to be clear, it's not easy to determine which it is. Russia has been intentionally opaque about the S-400's testing history, and in the few situations where the S-400 has found itself in real combat, its performance has prompted more questions than answers. So I set out to get to the bottom of this, and not just by going over publicly accessible media reporting about the S-400's development and its use in combat, but also peer-reviewed assessments from experts in a variety of nations, so I could get as broad a perspective as I could into how effective this system really is. And in my research, I came to two seemingly counterintuitive conclusions. The first is that the S-400 isn't nearly as capable as it's commonly perceived to be, but the second is that it is nonetheless one of the most advanced and capable air defense systems in use in the world today. Now, I know those seem like opposing views, but the complexity of the air defense enterprise is just so understated in media and popular discussion that it really lends itself to this sort of misunderstanding. The emergence of hypersonic missiles in recent years has really further exacerbated this unrealistic expectation that people have for modern air defenses. These fast-moving and maneuverable missiles are often touted as important specifically because they can defeat modern air defense systems. And that emphasis on their value as a means of overcoming air defense systems just sort of suggests that subsonic and even supersonic missiles can't. But that's not true. Intercepting any missile is a very difficult proposition that no air defense system in the world can manage with 100% efficacy all the time. Now, as is often the case, my full-length analysis into the S-400 is just too long to fit all in one video, but you can find it on sandboxnews.com. So if after you watch this, you want to dive a bit further into the nitty-gritty details, I definitely recommend you check it out. There will be a link in the description below. But now let's get down to business. Development of the S-400 probably began in the 1980s, but the effort wasn't revealed to the public until 1993, which you may note was two years after the collapse of the Soviet Union. Like many former Soviet programs that saw continued life under the newly formed Russian Federation, budgetary constraints dictated a great deal of the S-400's development and makeup. About 70 to 80% of its hardware is actually borrowed directly from the S-300 that actually began development all the way back in the late 60s. The primary changes between the S-300 and the more modern S-400 came in the form of updated and refined radar systems, improved software, and the incorporation of new missile types to offer more flexibility in target intercepts and an increased range. Another very important aspect of the S-400 system are its electronic warfare countermeasures, including radio frequency hopping to limit the effectiveness of jamming and agile beam steering for improved target acquisition and tracking. But the S-400's counter-stealth claims come largely thanks to the inclusion of Russia's Nebo-M radar, which combines three different arrays that broadcast on different frequency bands to detect, track, and even target low-observable aircraft, 
like America's fifth generation fighters. This system does so by leveraging a largely misunderstood attribute of stealth fighter design, their inherent detectability against low frequency radar bands. Now, we discussed this at length a few weeks ago, so I won't go too deep into the details, but modern stealth fighters are designed to delay or prevent detection against higher frequency radar arrays broadcasting in parts of the S, C, X, and KU bands, because these are the systems that are capable of providing what we call a weapons-grade lock. In other words, these are the arrays that can guide a missile to a target. Lower frequency arrays, leveraging the L or S bands, or even lower ones in the VHF bands, aren't capable of guiding weapons with this sort of accuracy, but they are capable of spotting stealth fighters in the sky. As a result, many nations have developed early warning radar systems that leverage low frequency bands to notify them of the approach of stealth fighters. But the thing most people don't realize about stealth fighters is that knowing it's there isn't the challenge. Being able to actually target it and shoot it down is. Russia's Nebo-M system incorporates three different radar arrays to try to get around this problem. Two of them are low-frequency arrays, the Nebo SVU in the VHF band and the Protivnik G in the L band, both of which can detect the presence of stealth fighters as they approach, but neither of which can actually target them. And that's where the Nebo M earns its pay, because it networks these two low-frequency arrays with Russia's Gamma S1 high-frequency array that broadcasts in the S and X bands that are capable of providing a target-grade lock. So, by tracking a stealth fighter with the low-frequency bands until it is close enough to actually target with a high-frequency band, the Nebo-M system offers a pretty effective means of keeping tabs on and eventually even shooting down stealth fighters. And this is where discussion about radar cross-sections, or RCS, become important. And technically speaking, a radar cross-section is the ratio of backscatter power to the power density that's received by the target, but for our purposes, you can think of a radar cross-section as the size of an aircraft's consistent radar return. But before we go further, I want to give you what's becoming my standard RCS disclaimer, which is that radar cross-sections are not widely divulged by governments and are incredibly difficult to calculate. So you should take any discussion about RCS, including discussion from me, with a grain of salt. America's F-35 is said to boast a radar cross-section of about 0.0015 square meters, or around the size of a golf ball, while the even stealthier F-22's RCS is more like 0.0001 square meters, or about the size of a marble. These both represent a huge improvement over America's first stealth aircraft, the F-117 Nighthawk, which had a radar cross-section commonly accepted to be around 0.003 square meters. Small as these are, you may note, small isn't invisible. And in practical application, stealth isn't about preventing detection altogether, but rather about delaying it for long enough for the fighter to either strike first or escape a potential threat. The smaller your radar return, the closer your aircraft needs to be to the array, in order to be effectively targeted. Now, according to a peer-reviewed assessment by Hellenic Air Force Colonel and electronics engineer Konstantinos Zadikis, published by the Journal of Computations and Modeling back in 2014, the Nebo-M's low-frequency radar arrays can detect the F-117 Nighthawk at a range of 350 kilometers, or about 217 miles, in an environment free of electronic warfare, and potentially as far as 72 kilometers, or 45 miles, while under heavy jamming. This detection range is the basis for so many S-400 counter-stealth claims, but it fails to acknowledge the difference between detecting a stealth fighter and actually targeting one. And it's further important to note that these detection ranges are based on the F-117, which has a radar cross-section that's about 30 times bigger than the F-22s and at least twice the size of the F-35s. As a result, both detection and targeting ranges for these more modern fighters would be reduced dramatically from those figures. Based on assessments, the S-400 can target the F-35, but almost certainly not until it flies within 20 miles of the system. 
As a result, in a one-on-one -on -one fight between America's F-35A, carrying the forthcoming AARGMER Extended Range Anti-Radiation Missile, which has a range of better than 60 miles, the F-35 is almost always going to come out on top. But that's also a bit misleading, because the S-400's real strength can only be found when incorporated into a larger integrated air defense system that would really complicate matters for an F-35 trying to take it out. But although Russian forces would certainly use the S-400 as a part of such an integrated air defense system, the third-party nations who purchase these platforms often don't, which means that really is how such a fight might play out if an F-35 were pitted against an S-400 operated by a third-party nation. Like all air defense systems, the S-400's field of view is limited by the horizon when not networked with other assets, particularly airborne ones like AWACS or tethered balloons called aerostats. And that's where Russia's modern warfare doctrine can really stand in their way. Russia's approach to warfare, as we've seen over the past five months of conflict in Ukraine, does not prioritize securing air dominance. And that may be a direct result of NATO's massive air power capabilities. Russia understands that it may not be able to gain or maintain air superiority in the event of a large-scale conflict. So rather than trying to win that losing battle, Russian doctrine has just shifted to accept the idea that it may not be able to control all of the airspace that it's fighting in. I have a full-length analysis into how Russia's warfare doctrine is playing out in Ukraine that you can read on Sandbox News. I'll include a link below. But to cut to the point, what this ultimately means is that the airspace over a conflict with Russia would remain contested at best for them, and at worst would be largely dominated by American or allied forces. And as you can probably imagine, when you don't have total control over your airspace, operating things like AWACS or tethered balloons to extend your radar reach just wouldn't be very easy to pull off. And that creates an opportunity for very specific kinds of attacks. I'm going to quote a RAND Corporation analysis by Peter Wilson and John Pericini about this specific set of circumstances. Without over-the-horizon sensors, the S-400 and other powerful HIMAD systems are vulnerable to a low-altitude attack by cruise missiles, which in large numbers can overwhelm an air defense system. And that line-of-sight problem can be made significantly worse by geography. If you're fighting in a mountainous area, it gets even harder to detect those low-flying threats. Now, a Russian S-400 battalion usually consists of eight missile launch platforms, each of which is armed with four missiles. Now, regardless of the missile types, that means that at best, an S-400 battalion can intercept 32 targets before it runs out of interceptors to fire. With an outside range of 400 kilometers or 250 miles, that means that even cargo aircraft like America's C-130 or C-17 could eventually become very effective S-400 hunters by using programs like Rapid Dragon to deploy a high volume of low observable cruise missiles from distances greater than 600 miles. Though, to be clear, in order to do this, you'd need to have good targeting data for those S-400 systems which may be fairly easy to come by via an F-35 flying outside the S-400's 20-mile targeting envelope. In an assessment of the S-400 penned by the Risk Assistance Network and Exchange that was actually arguing in favor of the S-400 platform, they still had to make this concession. Against a low-flying cruise missile, an S-400 will more likely find success at a distance in the tens of kilometers, rather than in the hundreds. Ultimately, an isolated S-400 battery, or even battalion, will therefore be vulnerable to a saturation standoff attack, and may even be destroyed without destroying a single enemy aircraft. And there's real-world data to back up that assertion. In April of 2017, American and Allied forces launched cruise missile strikes against Syrian targets in proximity to Russian S-400 systems that were online. And despite Russia's claims of defending airspace at 400-kilometer ranges, they failed to intercept any of these cruise missiles before they could find their target just 175 kilometers away. 
And Russian S-300 systems that leverage the same Nebo M radar arrays have consistently failed to prevent attacks from small drones, like Turkey's Bayraktar TB-2 and Israeli cruise missiles in places like Syria, and more recently, in the Nagorno-Karabakh conflict. There's a great assessment of the failures of a variety of Russian air defense systems in that conflict, penned by Shaza Arif, a researcher for the Pakistani Air Force's Center for Aerospace and Security Studies that was published in January of this year that I highly recommend reading. It is great stuff. And while the general fog of war makes it tough to know which air defenses are being used where in the fight for Ukraine, you can see clearly that these sorts of low-altitude, low-speed drone attacks have still been successful against Russian forces there as well. So does all this really mean that Russia's S-400 isn't actually any good? Well, no. The fact of the matter is, the S-400 and its recently deployed successor, the S-500, are probably very capable air defense systems. They just are limited by the physical, financial, and geographical constraints of their operational environments and of the nations that they serve. Like all weapon systems, their real value can only be found when properly integrated into a larger defense apparatus based on a functional and effective combat doctrine. The S-400 is almost certainly not the stealth-defeating air defense force field that it's often made out to be, but it is a very effective system with scalable capabilities through networked support. Should America be scared of the big bad S-400? Probably not. With systems like the F-35 and the F-22 in service, and platforms like the B-21, NGAD, and FAXX in active development, Uncle Sam shouldn't be shaking in his boots over the system. But make no mistake about it, underestimating the S-400 in combat could prove a costly mistake no matter what you're flying. And it just goes to show how important mission planning really is for all stealth operations. Real quick, before I go, I want to take a quick second to shout out my buddy Joe Wolf and his son Chris, who've been watching my videos together. Joe is a Marine veteran just like me and a Purple Heart recipient. He and I served together back in the day and even deployed to Africa together, man, like more than 10 years ago now. Thanks a lot for watching my stuff. Chris, your dad is the man. And with that ends yet another edition of Air Power from Sandbox News. I'm Alex Hollings. Make sure you swing by sandboxnews.com today and every day for all the latest in news, entertainment, and motivation from all around the force. If you got anything out of today's video, make sure to click like and subscribe down below and leave me a comment so I know what I should cover next. And of course, don't forget to tap on that bell icon so you never miss a drop from Sandbox News.